Hello and welcome to Unworthy History. Today we got some actual history for you from this book right here, Indian Depredations in Texas by J.W. Wellbarger. Now the story today takes place in Dawson, Texas. That's in Navarro County. It took place back in 1838 and it's called the Battle Creek Fight. And this account was written by one of the survivors. His name was Walter P. Lane. A surveying party being formed at Franklin in Robertson County, I went with William Love and others from San Augustine to join it, all of us having lands to locate. We organized at Franklin, 23 of us, selecting Neil, our captain, William Henderson being our surveyor. We started in September via Parker's Fort for Richland Creek, where we intended to make our locations. The second day we camped at Parker's Fort, which was then vacated, having been stormed about two years before by a body of Comanches who murdered all the inhabitants or carried them off into captivity, the two historical Parker children being among the latter. We passed Tewakana Hill on our way to Richland Creek and crossed through a dense thicket to the other side of the creek and encamped about a mile up on another stream where we were going to commence our operations. We found there some 300 Kickapoo Indians with their squaws and papooses who had come down from their reservation in Arkansas to lay in their supply of dried buffalo meat. For the country then abounded with any amount of game, and from the hills you could see a thousand buffalo at a sight. The Indians received us kindly as a great many of them spoke English. We camped by them three days, going out in the morning and surveying, and returning in the evening to camp in order to procure water. The third morning at breakfast we observed a commotion in the camp of our neighbors. Presently the chief came to us and reported that the Iones, a wild tribe, were coming to kill us. We thanked them for the information, but we were not afraid of the Iones, and we said that if they attacked us we would clean them out, as they had nothing but bows and arrows anyway. They begged us to leave, saying if the Iones killed us it would be laid on them. We refused to leave, but asked the chief why, as he took so much interest in our welfare, he could not help us to whip the Iones. He said he could not do that, as his tribe had a treaty with them. They begged us feelingly to go, but as we would not, they planned a little surprise for us. They knew where we had made a corner the evening before, and knew that we would go back there to commence work. So they put 100 men in a ravine we had to go by. We started out from our camp to resume our work, several of the Indians going along with us. One of them stuck to me like a leech, and succeeded in begging a piece of tobacco from me. Then, shaking hands with me, he crossed the ravine, within 50 yards of where his friends were lying in ambush for us. We got opposite to them, not suspecting any danger, when about 40 of them arose from the ravine and fired into us, killing some of our horses and wounding several of our men. Captain Neal ordered us to charge them, which we did, and routed them out of the ravine, when they fell back on a small skirt of timber fifty yards off, from which upsprung one hundred and fifty Indians, who then confronted us. We retreated back into the prairie. The Indians mounted their horses and surrounded us. They went round in a circle, firing into us. We got to the head of the ravine in the prairie and took shelter in it. The Indians put a force out of gunshot to watch us, while their main force went below about 80 yards where the ravine widened and they had the advantage of brushwood. They opened fire on us and shot all our horses except two, which were behind a bush, to make sure none of us should escape. The Indians had no hostility towards us, but knew as we were surveying the land that the white people would soon settle there and break up their hunting grounds, so they wanted to kill us for a double purpose. None would be left to tell on them, and it would deter others from coming into that section of the country surveying. We commenced firing into each other up and down the ravine. We sheltered by nooks, and they by the brush in their part. Euclid Cook got behind the only tree on the bank, firing at them. When exposing himself, he was shot through the spine. He fell away from the tree and called for some of us to come and pull him down into the ravine. I dropped my gun, ran up to the bank, and pulled him down. He was mortally wounded and died in two hours. 
We fought all day without water, waiting for night to make our escape. But when night came, also came the full moon, making it almost as bright as day. Up to this time, we had several killed and some badly wounded. We waited till near twelve o'clock for the moon to cloud over, but as it did not, we determined to make a break for Richland Creek Bottom. We put our four worst wounded men on the remaining two horses. As we arose upon the bank, the Indians raised a yell on the prairie, and all rushed around us in a half circle, pouring hot shot into us. We retreated in a walk, wheeling and firing as we went, and keeping them at bay. The four wounded men on horseback were shot off, and we put other badly wounded ones in their places. We got within 200 yards of timber, facing around and firing, when Captain Neal was shot through the hips. He called to me to help him onto a horse behind a wounded man, which another man and I did. We had not gone ten steps further when Neil, the wounded man, and the horse were all shot down together, and I was shot through the calf of the leg, splintering the bone and severing the leaders that connected with my toes. I fell forward as I made a step, but found I could support myself on my heel. I hobbled on with the balance to the mouth of the ravine, which was covered with brush into which four of us entered, the other three taking the timber on the other side. We had not gone about fifty yards down the ravine where it was dark and in the shade when I called to Henderson to stop and tie up my leg as I was bleeding to death. He did so, cut off the top of my boot, and bandaged the wound. We saw about fifty Indians come to the mouth of the ravine, but they could not see us as we were in the shade, so we went on down the ravine. They followed and overtook our wounded comrade, whom we had to leave, and killed him. We heard him cry out when they shot him, and knowing they would overtake us, we crawled upon the bank of the ravine, laid down on our faces with our guns cocked, ready to give them one last parting salute if they discovered us. They passed us so closely that I could have put my hand on any of their heads. They went down the ravine a short distance when a conch shell was blown on the prairie as a signal for the Indians to come back. After they had repassed us, we went down to Richland Creek, where we found a little pond of muddy water, into which I pitched head foremost, having been all day without any and suffering from the loss of blood. We here left Violet, our wounded comrade. His thigh was broken and he could crawl no further. He begged me to stay with him as I was badly wounded, and he said I could not reach the settlement some ninety miles distant. I told him I was bound to make the connection, so we bound up his thigh and left him near the water. We traveled down the creek till daylight, and then over the dry creek on a log, so as to leave no track in the sand, to a little island of brush where we lay all day long. In the morning we could hear the Indians riding up and down looking for us. They knew our number, twenty-three, and seven had escaped. They wished to kill all of us so it could not be charged to their tribe. We started at dusk for Tewakana Hill, some twenty-five miles distant. When I rose to my feet after lying all day in the thicket, the agony from the splinters of bone in my leg was so severe that I fainted. When I recovered consciousness and before I opened my eyes, I heard Burton tell Henderson that they had best leave me, as I could not get in and would greatly encumber them. Henderson said that we were friends and had slept on the same blanket together, and he would stick to me to the last. I rose to my feet and cursed Burton, both loud and deep, telling him he was a white-livered plebeian, and in spite of his 150 pounds, I would lead him to the settlements, which I did. We traveled nearly all night, but next day got out of our course by following buffalo trails that we thought would lead us to water. The country was so dry that the earth was cracked open. On the third day after the fight, we sighted Tewakana Hill. We got within six miles of it when Burton sat down and refused to go any further, saying that he would die there. We abused and sneered at him for having no grit and finally got him to the spring. We luckily struck the water 100 yards below the springs, where it covered a weedy marsh and was warm. Just as we got in sight of the water, ten Indians rode up to us. I saw that they were Kickapoos. They asked us what we were doing. I told them we had been out surveying, had a fight with the Ionis, and got lost from our comrades, and had gone another way to the settlement. They wanted to talk longer, but I said, Water! Water! The chief said, There is water. 
So I made for it, pitched head foremost into the weeds and water on my face, and drank until I could hold no more. Luckily for me, the water was warm. If I had struck the spring above, the water would have killed me. Henderson and Burton were above me in the water. In a short time, they called me. I heard them, but would not answer. I was in the water, covered by weeds, and felt so happy and contented, I would have neither moved nor spoken for any consideration. Henderson and Burton got uneasy about me as I did not answer, and came down the bank to find me. An Indian saw me in the water and weeds, waded in, and snaked me out. I asked the chief what he would take to carry me to a settlement on a horse. He looked at me. I was a forlorn object from suffering hunger and want of water. My eyes were sunk nearly to the back of my head, and he said, Maybe so you die tonight. I told him no unless he killed me. He replied, No kill. He asked, Want eat? We said yes. He answered, Maybe so. Camp in two miles. Come, go. Squaw's got something to eat. He helped me on a horse, and we went to camp. The women saw our condition and would only give us a little at a time. They gave us each a wooden bowl of soup composed of dried buffalo meat, corn, and pumpkins all boiled together. Green turtle soup with all its spicy condiments dwindles into insipidity when compared with my recollection of that savory broth. They waked us up twice during the night and gave us more. They understood our condition, knew that we were famished, and that to give us all we wanted at one time would kill us. We slept until the next morning when we wished to start, knowing that at any moment a runner might come into camp and tell them that it was their tribe that attacked us, and as we were the only ones who could criminate them, we must be killed. I traded a fine rifle of Henderson's for a pony and a saddle, but when I started to mount him, a squaw stopped me and said, No, my pony. I appealed to the Indian, who looked at me ruefully, and then he said, Squaw's pony showing that petticoat government was known even by the Kickapoos. We started on foot, my leg paining me severely. We had gone about three miles when six Indians galloped up to us on the prairie. I told my comrades our time had come. We got behind two trees and determined to sell our lives dearly. They rode up, saying, Howdy, we want to trade guns, showing an old dilapidated rifle to trade for our good one. We soon found out it was trade or fight, so we swapped, with the understanding that they would take me to Parker's Fort, about 25 miles on a pony which they agreed to. One Indian went with us, the balance going back and taking the rifle. We got near the fort in the morning, when Burton proposed to Henderson to shoot the Indian, who was unarmed, and I could ride to the settlements. Henderson indignantly refused, and I told Burton that rather than betray confidence, I would walk in on one leg. Five minutes later, I heard a gunfire to the right. We asked the Indian what it meant. He replied, Cassette, Kickapoo chief, camp there. So if we had shot the Indian, we would have brought down a hundred onto us to see what the shot meant. He then told me, Maybe so, you get down. Yonder is Parker's fort. Me go to Cassette's camp. I did so. We struck the Navasota River below the fort and waded down the stream a mile, fearing the Indians would follow us. We crossed in the night and went out some three miles into the prairie and slept. The Indians that morning had given us as much dried buffalo meat as we could carry, so we had plenty to eat on our way. We traveled all the next day and part of the night, having got on the trail that led to Franklin. We started the next morning before day. Going along the path, I was in the lead and we were hailed, ordered to halt and tell who we were. I looked up and saw two men with their guns leveled on us about 40 yards off. I answered, We are friends! I didn't blame them much for the question, for I was in my shirt and drawers, with a handkerchief tied around my head, having lost my hat in the fight, and they thought we were Indians. They proved to be my old friends, William Love and Jackson who had left our party some six days before for the settlements to get us another compass. They were horrified when we told them of the massacre. They put us on their horses and returned with us to Franklin, a distance of some 15 miles. The news spread over the neighborhood like wildfire. By the next morning, 50 men were raised, and piloted by love, they started for the scene of our disaster. I had been placed in comfortable quarters in Franklin, and kindly nursed and attended to by sympathetic ladies. 
Henderson and Burton bade me goodbye and went to their respective homes. We told Love's party where we had left Violet with his thigh broken and asked them to try to find him. The party got to Tewakana Springs and being very thirsty, threw down their guns to get a drink. Violet, who had seen them coming across the prairie, thought they were Indians and had secreted himself in the brush close by. But when he heard them talk and found out that they were white men, he gave a yell and hobbled out, saying, Boys, I'm mighty glad you have come. He came near stampeding the whole party, they thinking it was an Indian ambuscade. Poor Violet, after we left him in Richland Creek Bottom, stayed there three days subsisting on green haws and plums. Getting tired, he concluded to make for Tewakana Hills, as he knew the course. He splinted and bandaged his thigh as best as he could, then struck out and got there after a day and night's travel. Being nearly famished, he looked around for something to eat. In the spring, which was six feet across, he saw a big bullfrog swimming around. Failing to capture him, he concluded to shoot him. He pulled down on him with a holster pistol loaded with 12 buckshot and the proportional amount of powder. Having his back to the embankment down which the water ran, the pistol knocked him over it, senseless, breaking the ligature that bound his thigh. He remained insensible, he thought, about two hours. When he became conscious, he bandaged his leg as well as he could and crawled up to the spring to look for the frog. He found one hindquarter floating around, the balance having been blown to flinders. Being very hungry, he made short work of that. In a few hours after that, Love's party came up and supplied him with all that he wanted. They left him there until their return, they going up to the battleground to bury the dead and see if they could find any more wounded. When they got there, they found the bones of all are killed, the flesh having been stripped off by the wolves. And they also found, much to my satisfaction, 80 piles of green brash in the lower part of the ravine, from where the Indians were firing at us during the day, and under each pile of brush a copious quantity of blood, which proved that we had not been fooling away our time during the day. The company returned to Franklin bringing Violet with them, who recovered eventually from his wound. So that was quite a story from back in 1838 near Dawson, Texas. So this was before the city was founded. This was called the Battle Creek Fight. And it was uh, a confrontation with the Kickapoo Indians who had warned the surveying party to leave. Uh, but the surveying party didn't heed that warning and they were then ambushed. But a few of them survived, including this Walter P. Lane, who wrote down this account. So if you want to hear more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.